To begin my message, I have to say that I know there's a lot of people who have been worse off than I have in these last three years, some in our church. So I'm not sharing it because of that. And I'm not sharing it to make anybody feel sorry for me. I don't need any help in feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> No, I'm sharing this because my battle has been more spiritual than it has been physical. And to tell my spiritual journey, I have to refer to two TV preachers that I heard while I was in rehab at Carnegie Village. The first one, I never caught his name or the church that he belonged to or, or his program. All I know is he was black and they called him a bishop. So I will refer to him today as the black bishop, but I do so with all respect. He started off his message by saying, if you're alive today, you've got trouble. Because trouble and life always go together. And then he uh, said, maybe it's sometimes not as bad and sometimes it's worse, but trouble and life always go together. And then he said, and the older you get, it seems like the more trouble you have. And I began to wonder if he was reading my mail, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> but uh, then he said something very encouraging. He said, when we really understand how big God is, then all of our troubles will seem small. One, he loves us. Two, he knows what we're going through. And three, he's big enough to help us through it. <laughs> so if we really understand, then uh, our trouble seems not so big. But then he changed directions. And then I knew he was reading my mail, so to speak. You see, when I heard that I had Parkinson's and I started feeling the different effects of it, and I don't understand this myself, but I forgot all that God had been doing in my life for years. I don't know how I could, but I did. For you see, back in 1972 or 73, when we were in Juneau, Alaska, I was having my devotions one morning and I was struggling because the church was struggling. It was small when we got there and it just didn't seem to be going anywhere. And back then we couldn't, didn't have anybody to share it with. The DS lived a thousand miles away. The closest Nazarene minister to us was 300 miles away. And when we left California to go up to Alaska, we left everybody we knew, our parents, our family, and our friends. And to make it worse back then, you couldn't call anybody because they had what it was called a toll call and you couldn't afford to call anybody. So you were completely isolated. And I was reading the Bible for my devotions and I came across Second Chronicles, chapter 20. 
which David read this morning, the first 17 verses. And when I came to the 15th verse, and it says, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the battle is not yours, it's God's. And this weight just fell off my shoulders. And the peace of God fell my life. And I was set free. The church wasn't my responsibility. It was God's. My responsibility was to follow God's lead. But it was God's. It was his and so I started living it. I started preaching it. I started sharing it. I just lived it for years. And I don't understand it. But all of a sudden, when I found out I had Parkinson's, I took the battle back into my own hands. Well, the black bishop, who I say respectfully, came at me from a different direction. And he said, when you have trouble, you have to let it go. You can't hold on to it. And he repeated this several times. You can't hold on to it. You have to let it go. You can't hold on to it. You have to let it go. And somewhere in his repetition, I did just that. I let my Parkinson's go. I held on to it no longer. And the peace of God came back into my life. And I gave Jesus the battle <laughs> again. And that has to happen. You know, the uh, black bishop is right. Whenever we have a problem, when we ever have a battle, doesn't matter what it is, conflict or illness or very personal, we can't hold on to it. We have to let it go. If we ever want the peace of God in our life, we have to let it go. And if we don't, and if we keep holding on to it, it'll destroy us some day. We never knew why my father didn't like ministers. There must have been something that happened in his past, but he never shared it. But he didn't like ministers. And when his oldest son became a minister, he was very disappointed but I had to obey my heavenly father, not my earthly father, though I loved and respected him very much. A somewhat humorous thing happened that might have turned my father, started to turning him around. He was a policeman for 23 years with the LAPD, and one day he was sharing with a fellow officer and he was complaining about my becoming a minister. And the other officer said, well, I sure can think of worse things that he could become. <laughs> and I think it's kind of started turning my father away. But you know, if my father continued to hold on to whatever it was, I don't think he ever would have become a Christian. Because when you hold it on, you slam the door shut to God. 
He still loves you. He still wants to help you. But you've closed the door to him. Ah, but when you, when you let it go, when you no longer hold it, then you open the, wide, the door wide to God. And he can come in with his peace and his healing. And I'm not talking about physical healing now, but spiritual healing. He can touch our whole lives, every part of it, and set us free. Well, thankfully, somewhere along the way, my dad let it go. He didn't hold on to it anymore. And in his last weeks, actually his last days, Reverend Meredith, the pastor at the Church of the Nazarene in Santa Barbara, California, became a very close friend to my father. And uh, I talked to Reverend Meredith after my dad's funeral and he told me things I didn't even know. But my dad had become a Christian and he was growing spiritually. And my dad finally came to church. I'm not sure if he'd ever been. And he told Reverend Meredith, I'm going to start coming every Sunday now. But he couldn't keep his promise because the cancer took him before he could. But I believe my father is in heaven now in part, and we all know there's a lot more to do with salvation, but in part because he let it go, whatever happened so many years ago. And now God was able to touch him. Well, the second preacher, he really surprised me. I heard him the next Sunday morning. It was Greg Olstein. Now, I don't know if you know much about Greg Olstein or what you think about him, but I have a real problem with his prosperity gospel, his get rich theology. I uh, was hearing, I heard it, uh, his, his uh, treasurer say once, and he thought Greg Olstein deserved it, that he was worth more than $50 million. And I have a problem with that, and it's not jealousy. <laughs> but that morning, Greg Olstein hit me square between my eyes, or maybe better yet, God hit me square between my eyes through Greg Olstein. And he was also talking about when you have trouble in your life. And I don't think for a minute it was a coincidence that those two very different preachers were both talking about when you have trouble in your life. I think God was trying to get through to me through both of them, and he did. So Greg Olstein said, when you have trouble in your life, you can do one of two things. You can keep struggling with it, or you can let God teach you through it. And I was immediately convicted. Though although the Sunday before I had given my Parkinson's to God, I had never once allowed God to teach me through it. I have come to believe now, and this is not popular in church circles, but I think sometimes God leaves us in our problem, doesn't heal us, so he can teach us through it. <laughs> so 
Sorry, my mind failed me. I knew I was wrong. I confessed my sin to God. I know some people think they deserve to have a bad attitude when they're in trouble, but I confessed my sin to God. I repented. I gave it to him. And then I asked him to please forgive me. And he not only forgave me, but in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, he gave me a new attitude. Some of you might remember in a BBS a few years ago when we had the, the twins on the screen, one of their songs was, I have a new attitude. And God gave it to me then. So God had completely, well, God and I had completely dealt with my Parkinson's. I gave it to him. And then with a new attitude, I started to let him teach me. I didn't ask him to heal me. I asked him to teach me. And I know time's running on, but I, I just have to share two things that God has been teaching me right now. First of all, and I alluded to it in my prayer last Sunday, we are not to take anything for granted. It's not God's will for us to take things for granted. You see, I was just like you. I walked and ran through my childhood. I walked and ran through my teen years. And I walked and somewhere along the line stopped running <laughs> in my adult years. And I just took it for granted. It was just something I always did. I really didn't give it much thought. But when I couldn't walk anymore, I no longer took walking for granted. And you may walk all your life. I hope you do. Being able to walk is a gift of God, a special gift of God. But just don't take it for granted. I got to thinking about soldiers who step on line, landmines and those who had their legs shot up, about the women who were at the Boston Marathon and an assailant's bomb really took off some of their legs. People who have, have been in accidents like Johnny Erickson Toddy and uh, just illness. <laughs> we know that, don't we, Dolores? <laughs> And some of those soldiers and women can walk again through many surgeries and prosthetics and therapy. And I'll guarantee you they're not taking it, walking for granted anymore in their life. Well, the second thing that God has been teaching me is that not only can't we take anything for granted, but we need to replace taking for granted with thanksgiving. Instead of taking things for granted, we need to become very thankful people. Here's the way God's presented it to me, basically through my Parkinson's. When we really have a thankful heart, then the things that are, we can't, can't do anymore, are no longer a concern to us. We are thankful 
for what we still can do. Even if it's just a fraction of what we once could do. Oh, I uh, still get frustrated with my Parkinson's when I can't do something, but it's becoming less and less. And I do miss my two-mile walks every morning, at least two or th three or four times a day. But I am much more thankful for what God has been doing in my life. Most of you won't understand this, but I, I still thank God that I can do my exercises. <laughs> uh, albeit from my hospital bed or from my wheelchair, but you can do a whole lot of exercises laying down and sitting down. I'm thankful for my wheelchair. I don't enjoy having to sit in it. <laughs> but I can get around with it. I'm no longer just in my bed. I can get around with it. The other day, Janet and I went to a Cracker Barrel to celebrate our 61st anniversary. And the time before, when I got up, I passed out, I fell on, to hit the wall, fell on the floor, because all I had was my walker and the paramedics came and it was just a mess. <laughs> it ruined a perfectly good dinner. But this time, because I had my wheelchair, I didn't have to stand up. I didn't pass out. I didn't fall down. And we had a good time and a great dinner. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that I can still preach a sermon with God's help like this, albeit in my wheelchair. <laughs> and next time you walk across a room, don't take it for granted. Be thankful that you were able to do that because there are a lot of people who can't. And the next time you drive in a car, drive or, or be a passenger, don't take that for granted either. Uh, I guess it was over a year ago now, this middle-aged couple got in their car on Sunday to go to church at Kansas City First Church. And I knew them because they worked in Nazarene Publishing House on the third floor where I cleaned, and they often stayed late. And they almost made it. They came so close. We were in a bad accident before they got there. She was killed instantly, and he died sometime later. So when you get to your destination, thank God for it. You know, it doesn't take that long to stop long enough to give God thanks. And when you make it home safely, thank him even more. Did you know that every hour of the day, somebody somewhere doesn't make it back home. And we need to be thankful for God, not just take it for granted. I'm gonna cut this a little short, but I had another thing to share. You know, I don't get to preach that often, so I have to, doubled it into when I preach. But there's some people I would like to share my thanksgiving for today. 
We can't take our families for granted. We have to be increasingly thankful for them. My family's not here today, but that's a blessing because they finally found a church that they could go to. And my daughter has been working so hard to get her family into church, including her five great-grandchildren who are our five great-grandchildren, her grandchildren, our grandchildren. And I'm very thankful for Julie too, our daughter, because she has walked with me through these last three years. And it has been very encouraging. Thankful for my younger daughter too, Joy. She has got off track, not with the Lord anymore. But I believe it's just temporary. <laughs> she will find her way back. I may be gone, but she will find her way back. We can't take our church family for granted. And when we first came back, what was it, two months ago? I don't remember. I did give you thanks for your calls, for your cards, for your offers to help, and most of all, for your prayers. I actually told God this one time. I said, you don't have to answer my prayers. Just answer all the prayers of the people who are praying for me. <laughs> and he did, and he does, over and over again. I didn't always realize that, but I do now. We can't take our friends for granted. And I realized that most of our friends are our church family. But I have a friend named Gary who lives outside of Sacramento, California. He was, I was the youth pastor and he was in my youth group and he came to know the Lord and I discipled him for a couple years and then we got separated and then 22 years ago we reconnected and Gary has walked with me through these last three years. And I'm very thankful for him. I can count on three calls every week. My friend Gary, Pastor Eric, and Carter. <laughs> Speaking of good friends. And I'm also very thankful for you Pastor Eric, because you have walked with me these three years. And you have been a friend above and beyond. And you've helped me so many ways. And you supported me so much. And I know that there are many people here this morning that think the same way. There's one group, I try not to take too long with this, but there's one group I have to thank. And that's the medical people in my life. One doctor, two nurse practitioners, nurses and nurses aides, and therapists. A lot of them Christians. And they really do care for you. That's why they do what they do. And they want you to get better. They want you to become stronger. Laura, my home health care occupational therapist, I got through that, told me once when she was at our house, I want to help you to get better so you can get back to going to church. And if I ever see her again, I'm dismissed from the program now. Just, 
that if I ever see her again, I'll tell her her mission was accomplished. But there's one person I want to thank the most today, and that's Jen. I've told you this in private many times, but I want to tell you today in public, you have stood by me most of all these last three years. When I was in research hospital for four weeks, you came every day to see me and to spend time with me. And I know I wouldn't be here this morning without you. Actually, today I wouldn't be here this morning without Shirley as well. But you helped me get out of you helped me get out of the house. You helped me to bring the wheelchair around so I can get in the car. And normally you drive me here, but our car battery wouldn't work this day. But uh, I'm so thankful for you in my life. Your love, your support, your care, your encouragement, and your help are all the reasons why I am here today. You were a good caregiver to your mom, and now you're a great caregiver to me as well. And you never complain. Never once have I heard you complain, even though my Parkinson's has so turned around our life. And you've had to help me so much more. But I am thankful for all that you do for me. Now, there is one stipulation here. She always makes me say, please. <laughs> she says she wants to teach me good manners. <laughs> it's a family joke. <laughs> I'm just thankful for all the people that God has put into my life over the years. You know, and we've already had a time to gather together. But you know, there's no right or wrong way to respond to Jesus. We can come to the altar, the front of the church. We respond to Jesus where we sit. We can go to two or three others and pray together and worship together and come to Jesus. There is never any right or wrong way except do not respond at all. Why do we come to church? The main purpose is to respond to Jesus. And I know that many of you have already done that, and you do that every Sunday. But we're going to give you an opportunity, all of us, to respond to Jesus as we close this service. I'm gonna have a short prayer. We're gonna have the piano while we're responding and then Pastor Eric will close the service as God leads. Our Father, we know you're already here. We have felt your presence. And we know your heart's desire for us this morning is that we would respond to you. But we can't do it on our own. So we ask you to help us right now. In Jesus' name. Let us respond to Jesus this morning.